Today's job we're going to be learning is Gitin Daf Pevav. We're almost at the end of Masechet Gitin. Reminder, if you haven't registered for the CM, you can register for the live event at Atlantic Beach by emailing Erica Schwartz number six at gmail.com. And if you plan to come to the Zoom CM, so register for the Zoom CM with the links that were sent out and also on the homepage of our website. Also, the Simaniot, the bookmarks for Seder Nizikin are up. We're going to be starting our last Masechet of Seder Nashim completing it at the Yeshiva Chochmei Lublin, which will be Zoomed to everybody in the beginning of November. And then you will need bookmarks for Seder Nizikin. So the registration is up. The bookmarks are free of charge. They were, they were, they were partially sponsored by sponsors. And if you would like, you can make a donation of $10 or 36 shekel to Hadran in order to cover the costs of the bookmarks. Okay, but that is, uh, they really are free of charge. We'll mail them to you. God willing, the mail system will work and people will get them on time. That's why we're starting early. We're very excited. Okay, the next thing is our dedication for today. Today's staff is sponsored by Natalie Weissman in honor of Tippi Wolkenfeld. Tippi always inspires me and in memory of the most precious, Kiki. Okay, with that, we'll get started. We were talking about the language used for a get. Okay, and there's a study guide that will help organize today's stuff as well. So we were tra- talking about the wording of the get. So one of the last phrases in the get, or toward the end, it says, right, you will now be available to all men from this day. We talked about that at the end of yesterday's stuff. Ule olam, and forever. So now, why does it say, and forever? It's to exclude this question. The Rabbi asked Rav Nachman, Damar hayom i at ishti, ulemachar at ishti. If you remember, we had this question. What if he says, today you are my wife, but tomorrow you are not my wife? So we said that that, we ignore the second part. And today you're you're not my wife anymore, so you're basically divorced. So what they're saying here is la'olam means this is forever. Meaning I can't say, oh, tomorrow you'll be my wife. That's not a relevant issue at all. And therefore it's to say, there's no real question even, even though we answered the question there, that it is a complete divorce. But the point is he asked the question, and this is to say, just to make sure you have no questions about this whatsoever, the divorce is completely separating. You can't say, oh, and by the way, tomorrow you'll be my wife. You want to, you can, but you have to remarry her. Next, get shichor, hare ad bat, uh, sorry, gufo shall get shichor. Now we're back to the, the lines in the Mishnah that we saw where it said the content of an emancipation document you are a free woman, or you are for yourself. Now they bring up that Rabbi Yehuda said that when it comes to a shtar mechira, if you're selling a slave, you have to use the following language. This is what he recommended to use. Not that everyone has to use this, but this is what he recommended. Rabbi Yehuda said, this is how you, what you should put in the document. This is when you, it reminds me when when you buy land. Also, you have to make sure that there's no lien on the property and all of that, and that nobody else claims rights to this land. So this is kind of similar. When you have a slave that you're selling, you say, this person is fit to work, okay? Which could mean, right? There's, what Rashi says, this means is, there's nobody who claims that the sale can't go through for any reason. And therefore he is available to work for you. He is exempt and completely separated from freedom. There's nobody freed him. I didn't free him. Umin ilule. Nobody has any claims against him. Like if somebody has claims against him, either they could claim we own him, or they could claim some sort of monetary issue that he, he injured and then owes money for something, or which basically means if you buy him, you're buying him along with the responsibility for that. Umin aruge malka umalchita. And also, there's no the king or the queen doesn't have any claims against him. Rashi says this means they don't have a warrant out for his death, let's say, because often the kingdoms would murder, you know, execute people for all sorts of uh, crimes. So nothing like that, because otherwise he would be like a dead man and he wouldn't have any value. He has no, um, nobody claims he's their slave. Um, he has no blemishes at all. Or any boils. He doesn't have any boils that are either old or new. What is Ad Titzal? Rashi says, 
two years, meaning he hasn't had boils in two years because the concept is that, or, or uh, sorry, it's up to two years. Okay, I'm promising you, sorry, I confused it. I'm promising you that Rashi says here, if any boils come onto his, Rashi says on his face, but I think it means just in general on him, for the next two years, that would be a sign that it was boils that he already had from before. And basically, I'm assuming it's kind of like a warranty. I'm, a, I'm, warrant, I'm giving you a guarantee that any boils that come out of, of the next two years, if that happens, then I will be responsible because the assumption is boils that come out are from old boils that were from before and basically it's committing there are no problems. I saw in the Safari they translated four years. I assume that there's different commentary that says four years. Um, I didn't happen to see it inside, but a certain amount of time, Rashi says it's two years, I'm going with that. My asvate, what is the cure actually for these boils so that they don't come back? I'm Rabaye. Gimbera, which is ginger, it actually sounds kind of ginger. Usually it's zangvil. Here it says gimbera. Um martecha. Martecha is um the the when you when you have uh silver, it's the psolet, the the bad parts that come out of it. Um you put that, okay. So like when you prepare silver, the the parts that you don't want, vikabrita and sulfur. And chala de chamra, wine, for, uh, vinegar made from, that comes from wine, spoiled wine. Umishcha de zeta, olive oil. Vinatfit chivara, and nef, nafta, that's white. And shai fele begad fedaf. So you mix those all together and then you spread it on your body with, on the, where the boils are, with a feather from a goose, a goose feather. Okay, strange uh, concoction. We're already familiar with many concoctions the Gemara comes up with that people use as remedies. Okay, again, maybe if you looked at all the ingredients and the medicines and the creams that we use, you probably also find it strange. New mission. Okay, so what we had so far is the language of Olam. Then we went to this get shikhur and we saw what Rabbi Yehuda said people should write in a get when they're selling a slave, what should be said there. Mishnah, this is a very central mission, and we made reference to it earlier in the Masechet. There's three gitim that are disqualified, but in Nisei Tablad Kasher, if the woman went anyway, got married based on these gitim, the child that was born from the second marriage, if there was a child, would be kasher, meaning they wouldn't be considered a mom. Zero, meaning she's not necessarily not, she's not necessarily still married to the first guy. However, the rabbis disqualified this gift. So, Kind of sounds like, well, you shouldn't get married based on this get. You'd have to get a more proper get. But if you did get married and you had children, your child wouldn't be a mom. Now the commission is going to continue and say, what are these cases? Number one. So there's three. Here we start with the first. The get is written in the handwriting of the husband, even if it doesn't have witnesses. So theoretically, it seems pretty clear if the husband's writing it. In his own handwriting, it must be a legitimate get. Otherwise, why would he? Why would it appear in his own handwriting? On the other hand, he, it doesn't have any witnesses signed, so it's a problem. Okay, there's a debate among Rashi and Tos, or Rashi quoted here and Rashi quoted by Tosfot about what exactly is going on. So let's look in Rashi here. Rashi here says, "Hi, Tana Lav ki Rabbi Meir Svirale." This mission does not go like Rabbi Meir, who holds. Eide uh, sorry, Eide okay, we're going to go back to the famous Machloka we've talked about many times. Rabbi Meir says it's the witnesses that sign that are important. And here you see they're not right that here you're missing signatures. It's actually valid on a Torah level. It's just invalid on a rabbinic level. So that doesn't seem to match Rabbi Meir. And then um, we're going to see later, Laman de Moke Lava Gemara, Ke Rabbi Meir. Well, the Gemara does in the end say that this is Rabbi Meir. So how does he explain that? He says, You could explain that because it's written in his handwriting, it's like, it's equivalent to as if a hundred people signed the get. Okay. So according to Rashi, what we're going to say is, so now he basically says, at first glance, it looks like it's not Rabbi Meir. However, right, it is Rabbi Meir in the end because he's going to say, right, and therefore, just one second, right. it's obviously not for Rabbi Elazar. We're going to see why, because Rabbi Elazar argues at the, at the continuation of this mission, argues with Tanakama. Okay. And then we're going to say, um, so one option again is to go by saying, 
This is Rabbi Meir. And that you can see because you say basically when, it, when, when someone admits, which is basically the husband admitting, that's as if there were 100 witnesses. But if you look in Tosfot, Tosfot says, no, not that one. I explained, Tosfot obviously had some version of Rashi that said, this is some third opinion. It's not Rabbi Meir, it's not Rabbi Elazar. And Tosfot rejects that because Tosfot says, what do you mean? Says later in the Gemara that the Mishnah is Rabbi Meir, so how could you possibly say it's not? Okay, so it did sound like Rashi was starting out to say that, but in the end, kind of Rashi does say it actually matches Rabbi Meir. And the reason is because May Edim uh the, the husband writing it is as if he's like 100 witnesses, and therefore it would be valid on a Torah level. Again, just the rabbis disqualified it. And what, why the rabbis disqualified it? That's another machloka between Rashi and Tosfot. Rashi explains that the reason the rabbis disqualified it is because we're worried that if you allow this get without witnesses, maybe you'll allow a get that was written by a sofer and not the, hu- not the husband. Tosfot says the concern is that maybe the husband will write any date that he wants. In other words, it's true he's admitting there's a get here, but he could play around with the dates. And that we already saw the whole problem, two issues with playing around with dates. So we're going to talk about dates in a minute anyway, but it could be he could just change the date. And therefore, it's kind of like the next case where we're going to see where it doesn't have Zman in the get at all. Okay, so that's the next one. Yesh alav edi be'en There's witnesses, but there is no time written in the get. That's also going to be disqualified on a rabbinic level because it was the rabbis who said we should make sure there's a date in the get. And then we had the two reasons, either because of payroll, the produce, who does it go to from that date on? If, it's the, if it, the get was valid from that date, it's the woman's. If, if, right, if it wasn't valid yet, then it's the man's. Or because of Shema Yechpel Bata Choto, if he wants to protect his, let's say he's married to his niece and he wants to protect her if she had cheated on him and he didn't mind and he was happy to waive the, the punishment for her, then he could claim, give her a get, switch the date, make it earlier, and it would be a problem, right? So if there is no date in the get, he could claim it was given at some earlier date. What if it does have a date, but it only has one witness? So that also, because it doesn't have two witnesses, it's going to be a problem. What exactly this case is, we're going to have to get to later. It's a bit of a just debate. Who wrote the get in this case? Is it the husband writing the get, or is it the sofa writing a get? How could it be it's okay if there aren't two witnesses? So we'll have to get to that later. Hare Elu, here comes the summary verse, even though we're not done with the Mishnah yet. Hare Elu Shloshagitim Psulim. These are three gets that are disqualified. Now that's a total repeat of the first line of the Mishnah. It's a little bit strange why it's here. Later, the Gemara is going to ask about that. So we have these three. Let's just review. It's written in the husband's handwriting, but it doesn't have witnesses at all. It has witnesses, but it doesn't have a date. It has a date, but it doesn't, it only has one witness. And we'll have to figure out what that case is. Rabbi el now it says Rabbi el but it really is Rabbi el and that becomes clear from the Gemara in the continuation. Rabbi el Romeo, at least the way the Gemara understood the Mishnah, that it was Rabbi el who again holds Edimus Sirakartes, the witnesses that, w- that view the giving over of the get that are the ones that are important. He says, Even if it doesn't have witnesses, but they gave it in front of witnesses. In other words, there's Adim Masira. This is classic, his opinion. In other words, you don't need Adim to make it a good get. It's Kashil. It's a totally fine get, even without witnesses. Now, if you remember the mission, it said, what if it's written in the same way? But there aren't witnesses. It doesn't matter if there's witnesses, he says. But, and also if it's written, right, it has mom, but there's only one witness. Obviously, you'd say it, that's totally fine. But, right, and, sorry, and even more so, it can be collected with lien, from lien property. Okay, what does it mean collected from lien property? What lien property is there here? Some people say we're talking about the woman's ketuba, and it means she can collect her tuba from lien property based on this get. However, most people, and the way the Gemara is going to go later on, is going to be to assume from here that Rabbi Lazar holds Edimus Yerukarte not only by Gen, but also in all other documents. So if, let's say, we have a loan, and we don't have witnesses signed, but there's witnesses who viewed the passing over of the document, the loan taking place, then it's enough, even, right, even though there's no witnesses signed, you could still the, the creditor could collect the loan from lien property. And he holds that it applies not only forget this law, Edimus Yerukarte, 
which we've been talking about all along, forget, but it also applies in other documents as well. Next, um, out. and then he continues and explains, Shane, I didn't quote me malaket, elamipnei tikkun haolam. This is Rabbi Elazar's opinion, or although we did see how to explain that mission, remember the mission appeared earlier in the fourth chapter, we had two ways of explaining it, one according to Rabbi Elazar, one according to Rabbi Meir. This obviously is uh, in the words of Rabbi Elazar, but the only point of the Hatimot is mishum tikkun olam, just in case we can't find the Adi Masira, at least we have a document with signatures that we can verify. So now the Gemara starts off with a basic question and says, but two Leica, what are there no other cases where you can say that that the get is disqualified in a rabbinical level? But if the woman got married based on it, the Vlad is going to be a mom's heir. And what we're going to do right now is talk about there's basically four different levels of severity of disqualified gets. Okay, so we have a get. Let's talk about the four levels. Okay, we have two extremes, which are she can't get married based on it. And if she does, the Vlad's going to, we make her get divorced and the child is a mom's heir. That's one extreme. That's not what our mission was talking about. The other extreme is it's an invalid get, but we'll actually let a woman get married based on it anyway, because it's a small disqualification. It's a disqualification that basically says you shouldn't do this, but if you did it anyway, we'll say it's a good get. Okay. And that was just a deterrent. Okay. But it's not going to really affect you in the end if you got divorced based on them. Those are the two extremes. Obviously, that's not what Armish is talking about. Armish is saying the get is pursu, disqualified. Disqualified means you can't get married based on it. What's unclear in our mission, and this we're going to get to a big machlok at later, and it's going to be referenced right away here, which is the two in between cases is, are, so she can't get married based on this, but if she did, maybe she doesn't have to get divorced. And obviously the kids are not going to be mom's area, maybe she did. Um, right. So in other words, don't remarry, but if you did remarry, we'll let you stay married to your second husband and any children you have will not be mom's heir. The second middle possibility, and that's going to give us four options, basically, I'll review them in a minute, is you can't get married, but if you do get, and, and if you do get married, we're going to make you get divorced. But if you had children, the children are not mom's heir, because we'd always rather avoid mom's heir cases. And we could say it's good enough of a get that your children aren't mom's heir, but we're going to make you get divorced if you're married. So basically, we have four options. Let's go from, from the lightest to the more strict. You can get married based. It's just not a good get, but you shouldn't do it. But if you did, you can get married based on it. In other words, that's already been the end. That you can get married based on it is, well, the get's already done, so we'll let you get married based on it. Second category, and it's going to be different cases fall into different. Again, as I said, these are levels, uh, different levels of severity of a disqualified get. The next is, you can't get married, but if you did, we don't make you get divorced and your children aren't mom's heir. Third is you can't get married. And if you did get married, we make you get divorced, but your children are still not mom's heir. And the fourth is you can't get married. If you did get married, we make you get divorced and your children are mom's heir. That's a, a real serious disqualification. So now the Gemara is going to ask basically, why didn't our Mishnah name more than three? Seems very clear from our Mishnah there's only three in this category. Why not? There's other ones in this category as well. Now, the issue is going to be that we don't really know which category ours falls into, two or three, right? Do they need to get divorced or do they not need to get divorced based on, right? From this, Does she need to get divorced from the second marriage or not? So every time we're going to kind of play with that and put the other one in a different category and then say, oh, right, between categories one and four, we're going to say all these cases you're bringing up, all the disqualified gets aren't in the same category as this one because this is three and that's two, or this is one and that's two, or different ones like that. Okay, so vituleka vaika get yashan. But isn't there a get where after he wrote the get before he gave it to her, they were alone in a room and they're suspected of having had relations, and that will disqualify the get. To which the Gemara answers, ah, hatam lo tetse. Ha ha tetse. So that the first answer is that case is a case where she doesn't have to get divorced if she married someone else. Meaning she can't marry ideally with this get, but if she did anyway, we won't make her get divorced. That's category two. In our case, we're now putting in category three. Tate says she has to get divorced. To which the Gemara says, I already mentioned this machloket about our mission, is it case two or is it case three? Hani chalamanda amar hacha It makes sense if you say here, Tate say, that this case is Tate say, then that's two, this is three. Elalamanda amar hacha lo Tate But if you say that here you don't have to get divorced, then how can you possibly explain it? To which they answer, hatam tinase lechatchila hacha diavad. There, she gets married. No, you misunderstood. Get Yachan is in category one, you could say. 
And so the first answer was it's in two and this is three. The other answer is say, no, no, that's category one and ours is category two where she doesn't have to get divorced, but she can't get married based on it. Okay, so hachatina se lechatchila hachadiyava. There, she can get married. If You shouldn't divorce a wife with a get yashan if you were alone in the room with her after it was written. But if you did already, you can still get married. But our case, you actually can't get married based on it. You just don't have to get divorced if you did, but you can't get married. Ideally. The how you can get. So that was case one. Okay, yashan, we had two possible answers depending on how you view our case. Now, next case. How you can get kereach. Remember, that's the get that has all the folds. And then... It's signed on almost all the folds except for one. So that's called a bald get, which means it's disqualified, to which they answer, uh, that's not a problem because that's also a rabbinic issue. Well, hatam vlad mamzer, hacha vlad kashil. There, the vlad is a mamzer. If you go with a get kereach and you go get married and you have children, your child's a mamzer. So that's category four and ours is category three. Right, hacha vlad kashil, or two or three. We're not really sure, but it doesn't really matter here. To which the Gemara asks, Hani chala Rabbi Meir. Wait, who says that the Vlad is a mamzer? Only Rabbi Meir says it. Said anyone who changes from the way the rabbi said the get needs to be is a mom, the child's a mamzer. Right? He had a very extreme opinion. We saw this there, which means your get kereach is going to create mamzerin if you get married based on that, because the rab- rabbi said this is ha- what, what happens in a get kereach. If you remember, it already has two, it, it has at least two kosher signatures. So theoretically, on the Torah level, it's a valid get. But the rabbis forbade it because the rabbi said you have to fill in all the all the signatures. And therefore, if it's missing one signature, then it's disqualified and the ch- children are mamzerim because you've changed the way the rabbi said this get has to go. But what are we going to say about the rabbis? According to the rabbis, right? Not according to Rabbi Meir, it's the same as our case. The Vlad is not a mamzer, in which case it's just like our mission, which is it's disqualified in a rabbinic level, but the Vlad is kashil. So again, we're going to get into tetze and lo tetze. So again, what is the Gemara answer? Ha tam tetze, ha chalo tetze. Again, that's more severe. So there, even the rabbis, even though the vlad's not a mom's there, it's going to be category three. You have to get divorced. Our mission is going to be category two. You don't have to get divorced if you got married based on this. Obviously, you know where the Gemara is going now, which is, or maybe you don't, but you'll see in a minute. Just like the last, ha chalamanda amar, Ha chalotetse, that makes very oh, perfect sense. Sorry, hani chalamandamar, ha chalotetse. That works perfectly fine according to the one who says our case is case two. Our Mishnah is you don't have to get divorced. But lamandamar ha chalotetse, but the one who explains our Mishnah as being number three, then they're going to overlap this case and get kereach, in which case, why isn't get kereach mentioned in our Mishnah? Why is it only say three? To which they answer, ah, lo kamare. Simple answer. Our mission was talking about three gitim that are disqualified. When you're writing a normal get, a normal get just has two signatures at the bottom, doesn't have all these folds and all that. That's a unique case where you did a get a get mikushal, and then it's going to be disqualified if it's a get kerach. But our mission wasn't relating to a get mikushar to this tie get, the folded and tied get. So therefore, it just wasn't relating to that case, and that's why it doesn't appear. So again, there were different answers how to do this, either Rabbi Meir or you think our Mishnah. They don't have to get divorced in that. You do have to get divorced. Or you just say, if they really are going to be one and the same, then you say, our minister wasn't dealing with that. Remember, we learned also, you have to write the year of the king that's reigning in that place where you live. And the rabbi said, has to be that. And if you don't have that, it's disqualified in a rabbinic level. To which they answer, they weren't talking about, I'm sorry, I just skipped the line. I went back by accident. (laughs) Totally mistake. Let's start again. Ha'ika shalom achub. But what about that case? Hatam teitzei hachalot teitzei. Same answer. That is more severe. You have to get divorced. This you don't have to get divorced. Hani halamanda amar hachalot teitzei. Alalamanda amar teitzei ma'ika lememer. But what about the one who says you have to get divorced? And that is the option that our mission is case three. Then that's case three, and this is case three. To which they answer. Hatam avla mamzer hachavla kashim. Okay, this is in parentheses, but I'm going to read it anyway because it makes sense to read. There, the Vlad is a mamzer, you could say. And in our case, the Vlad is not a mamzer. That's four, this is three. To which the Gemara says, Well, that's only according to Rabbi Meir that the Vlad's a mamzer. What about according to the rabbis? To which they answer very simply, This is where Rashi quoted this before, that the Mishnah in the end is going to have to be according to Rabbi Meir. And therefore, And therefore, 
And that's the difference because Rabbi Meir again said, anyone who changes from what the rabbis instituted and Shlomo who was what the rabbis instituted, you're going to have to say the Vlad is a mom's there, in which case that's case four, this is case three. And then our Mishnah only works according to Rabbi Meir, not the rabbis. Again, assuming that our get our Gitim, our Mishnah, is a case where they have to get divorced if she gets married based on that. Okay, so we basically brought three questions. We brought the get Yashan, why is it not there? The get Mikusha, the get Kereach, why is it not there? The one missing the signatures on the fold to get, and the Shloma Chut, why is it not there? And each time we gave different possible answers depending on how you understood our mission. Now the Gemara is going to ask, Minyana de Rachel de why does it say Shlosha Gitim? Why does it count three? Three means like, sounds like three and no others. So that's very easy. Right? The question is though, why in the beginning does it say three? And why at the end does it say three? Each time it must be coming to exclude something else. So Well, the first one is to say these three and not get Yashan, not get Mekushar, depending on which reading, whether you need to exclude that case or not. And not shloma chut, but minyana de seifa lemeute. What's that coming to? It must be something else coming for another case. Titania brings us back to the very beginning of our masechet. But always fun at the end when you get back to the beginning. Titania hamevi get me medinat hayam nitano la velo amal befanai nechta befanai nechtam. Well, the brighter says if you bring a get from abroad and you don't say that with the messenger didn't say in front of me it was written in front of me it was signed. Yotzi v'havlav mamzer. So they get divorced, and the child is a mamzer. Divrei Rabbi Meir. So it, now we already said that the Mishnah is like Rabbi Meir. So that's already your answer, although we're going to continue in the bright time, that this is to exclude that case, because in that case, the vlad is a mamzer. You didn't say v'fanei nechta, v'fanei nechta. That makes the vlad a mamzer. This fits in with what he said. Anyone who changes from what the rabbi said, the vlad is a mamzer. The rabbis say it's not. What do you do to fix this situation in either case? Because in either case, you can't really get married based on this get. He basically has to take the get back, redo the whole giving of the get, and then say in front of two witnesses, in front of me it was written, in front of me it was signed. That would be the only way to resolve that type of a get. The point is that according to Rabbi Meir, the Vlad is a mom's there there, and our mission is coming to teach us these three and not that one. And that's why it's repeated a second time at the end, because this is another case of a disqualified get. Now we're going to go into this case of Katab. No, well, actually, we're going to quote this line, but then we're going to talk about him writing his own get. Katab v'chatab yadov v'analav edim. It's written in his own handwriting, but there's no witnesses. Amalav v'chatab yadov shanin. So Rav says the following about this Mishnah. Not clear exactly where we're going with this, but k'tav yadov shaninu. This means only if it's in his hand. Yeah. Hiya. On what, what line is this referring to? So either referring to case one, two, or three. Let's try to go through. Elema Resha, the first one, Pshita. Why is Rav telling us this? Of course, it says it's written in his handwriting and there's no witnesses. Obviously, that's his handwriting. You don't need to tell us that. It's quite clear. Second case, Ela Mitziata. If you go to the middle case, what's the middle case? There's witnesses, but there's no time written. There's no date written in the get. It has aging. What does it matter? If it's a totally irrelevant point. The fact that it's missing a date has no bearing whether the husband wrote it or didn't write it. It's irrelevant. There's even witnesses. That's more than his own handwriting. So therefore, it's an irrelevant factor. It can't be that. Ela asefa must be on the last line, which is yesh bo zman ve'embo ela ed echa. There's a date, but there's only one witness. And now comes Rav to say, v'davka k'tav yado ve'ed. This is going to be good in a case when you have his handwriting, his own handwriting, and one witness. Remember we said that we weren't sure what this case is. We're now going to see some look at Rav and Shmuel. If it says there's only one witness, it must be, according to Rav, that he wrote it in his own handwriting, and there's one witness, and the combination of those two factors makes this a valid get. Aval, tough so fair, the aid low. But if it was a so fair, and there was one aid, for sure that wouldn't be good at all, because there's no, I'm sorry, that wouldn't be disqualified, sorry, my mistake. One second. Let me just clarify. Yeah, the kashe, right. If it's k'tav yado, then it will be okay if she got married based on it. But right, k'tav sofer ve'ed wouldn't work. Okay? If it's the sofer and a witness, that wouldn't work. Ushmuel amar afilu k'tav sofer ve'ed. He says, what do you mean? Even the k'tav sofer and a witness would work. How do I know this? Shareh shaninu. Now, we didn't get to this, but in 
Tomorrow's down. This is a Mishnah. It says, Ketav Sofer Ve'ed Kashil. If a Sofer writes it and the witness signs, it's good. Why is that good? Actually, it makes sense because the Sofer is kind of acting like a witness. Now, it's obviously better if it's the husband's own hammering. So that's a further proof that it's actually a valid get because he wrote it himself. If it's a Sofer writing it, you never know. Maybe the husband didn't tell the Sofer to write it. Why the Sofer would write something the husband didn't tell him to do would be a little weird, but still, you don't have him. But According to this Mishnah, it's actually kashil. To which Rav says, wait a minute. Midane. Hatam tina said lechatrila. Hacha diavad. Wait a minute. Rav says, you can't say that that's the same thing as here. Because that obviously is talking about something else. How do you know that's talking about something else? Because there it says she can get married. It says kashil. Look at the language. Kashir means, not just kashir bediavad. Kashir means she can get married based on this get. Okay, it's a totally good get. It's a get that she can get married based on. This is only, right, it's, it's pasul on a rabbinic level, right? We're just going to kind of allow it. If it's already done, then, you know, the children are not mamzerim. So therefore, Rav is actually going to understand that case in a different way than we've understood it until now. Okay, he's going to understand that case as, um, one second, right. He's, he understands that case in a different way. Um, just one minute, right. So he's going to understand the way Rabbi Yirmiya is going to explain it. And we'll see in tomorrow's stuff. Let's actually wait till we get there. Okay. He's going to explain this Mishnah, not in the simple reading. Okay. He doesn't think that that's what this Mishnah means. We have a long doc today, so I'm going to leave it for tomorrow's explanation. Okay. So now, what does Shmuel say? Shmuel Lokashia. Shmuel says they are actually talking about the same cases. Now, why? In one case, is it okay? In the other case, is it right? One, in, according to that mission, it's kasher entirely. Here, it's pasul. Okay, so what's the reason? He says, ah, because remember, it's pasul. It's only good, according to Shmuel, if it's ketav yado. Then we'll say the get is pasul, but it's okay. But if it's a ketav so fair, no way, no how. So I'm sorry, I got confused. Even ketav so fair the aid. Shmuel says, Ketav Sofer Ve'ed is the same as here, is category, again, it's either two or three. Let's go back to our categories from before. Let's just clarify. According to Shmuel, the next Mishnah, it's Kasher. If a Sofer and an Eid are there, we're going to allow the woman to get married based on this. That's case one, okay, category one. Our Mishnah is category two or three. That's a Sofer and an Eid. So how could that be? Sofer and an Eid, you can marry Lechatfila. Sofer and an Eid, you can't marry Lechatfila, but... Maybe you have to get divorced. Maybe you don't have to get divorced with the kids and moms there. Category two or three. How does Shmuel rectify that? So he basically says, Haba suffered the mufa, Haba suffered the low mufa. It really depends on what's the issue. You're, we, we learned this whole thing about the Sofer Ve'ed. It came up in a few sugas before, which is the concern is that maybe the husband didn't ask the Sofer to actually, he asked the witnesses to write the get and not to invite the Sofer to write the get. And maybe it's not the person, maybe it's not done the way the husband wanted. Well, if he's a sofer mufak and he's an expert sofer, then he knows what the husband wants. And he knows that he can only do it if the husband wants him to do it. And therefore you can actually get married based on this get. But if the if he's not a sofer mufak, then it's going to be disqualified in a rabbinic level because there's a concern that maybe the husband didn't actually appoint this and maybe he didn't want this sofer to write the get. And therefore it's not done the way the husband wanted and therefore it's an invalid get. So though, that's how Shmuel views our Mishnah compared to that Mishnah. And again, let's just review this section. Okay, let's actually review until this whole point. Um, so we started with the Mishnah, three Yutin Lidur Pesulim. We then said, what about Get Yasham? What about Get Kereach? What about Shlom Malchut? Then we said, what's the number? Three repeated twice coming. The first one was to exclude those three cases. The second one was coming to exclude the Bifanai Nechtam, Bifanai Nechtam, if you didn't say that. then. We got to this thing about Katab that um, Rav says it's only if it was written in his handwriting. A sofer would be, right, if the sofer wrote it, it wouldn't be accepted at all. To which we said, right, what line is he referring to? He's referring to that last line where we have a sofer, where we have a uh, either, right? The sofer wrote it and there's one witness signed or the husband wrote it himself and there's one witness signed. So according to Shmuel, both those cases are going to be we're not going to say the Vlad's a mom's there. Why? Right? They're going to be either two or three, category two or three in our list. Because the assumption is, and this I didn't really discuss before, but again, husband writing it 
and an aide signing. It's already kind of two people verifying. The SOFAIR writing and the husband signing is also like two people verifying. And Shmuel thinks that that's fine. By the conclusion of the Gemara, we said only really if it's a SOFAIR move hack. He really knows the laws. Otherwise, there's maybe a concern that maybe he, the husband didn't really want this SOFAIR to write. Rav distinguishes and says, no, no, no. SOFAIR is no good at all. He thinks it's invalid. How does he explain the, next, the upcoming mission where it says it's kasher? He thinks that's something else entirely. And that's how we're going to explain that tomorrow. And he thinks that Sofer and Eid Echad is actually totally disqualified. And our mission is trying that specifically only if it's in his own handwriting. That, together with the one witness, makes it at least somewhat valid, even though the rabbi's disqualified. Okay, moving on. Now we have Vachen. Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said, just like Rav, and not like Shmuel. Rabbi Yochanan said, Rabbi Yochanan says, but there's witnesses. Now, this is weird. There aren't witnesses. There's only one witness. But Rashi explains that Rabbi Yochanan was confused. By, by the way, this is Rabbi Yochanan the Amora, not the Tana that we've been talking about. He didn't understand what Rabbi Yochanan was talking about. He thought that Rabbi Yochanan was talking about the middle case where there's two witnesses in it. He said, no, no, no. Amr Leia Seifi said, no, no, you're confused. I was referring to the last case where there was only one witness, and then it would have to be in the husband's handwriting in order to say that it's pasul, right? Kasher on a Torah level, but pasul on a rabbinical. Now we get to that issue we were discussing previously, which is that what's the case, the three gitim that are pasulim, does she have to get divorced if she got remarried based on this get or not? So sometimes Rav said yes, and sometimes Rav said no, and this is very fascinating. Why? What would be the case? If she has sons already, then we don't make her get divorced because that will make people say, oh, the kids are mom's name. But if she doesn't have children, then we make her get divorced. So we look at the situation, then we decide how severe we're going to treat her. What he's kind of saying is we have a little flexibility here to be more strict or more lenient. Depends on the scenario, whether she's already had children with that husband. Matib Marzutra Bartuki says, but wait a minute. It says in this other source, and you'll have to wait a few minutes to understand this. All these cases, if there was a doubt about whether, we're going to see a bunch of cases, if there was a doubt whether the woman was divorced, okay, what cases? Let's go back. We're talking about the first mission in Yavamut. The first mission in Yavamut says there's 15 women that if they fall to Yibum to someone who they're related to, let's say they're married to their father's brother, the, the father, the husband dies, she falls to Yibum to her brother. If there was a second wife there, not only is the first wife who's now has to do yibum with the father, of course, she can't do that. She's just, she's exempt from yibum. The, the other wife that this husband had when he died without children also is exempt from yibum. That's the whole first mission. And now they say, what if the erva, the woman who was related, the daughter of the brother she now falls to yibum to, um, what if she was only possibly married to him, possibly betrothed him, and not fully betrothed, not definitely, or possibly divorced from him. Okay, so, Ketzad, Safek Kiddushin. What's Safek Kiddushin? Zarak Kiddushin, Safek Karov La, Safek Karov Lo, Zeu Safek Kiddushin. So if, let's say, the second wife is false to Yibam to this guy, the first wife, or the, the one who's the daughter of this guy, is perhaps betrothed, was perhaps betrothed to the one who died and was perhaps not betrothed. Then there's not a full exemption for the second wife. So what does she do? She does chalitza, gets out of the obligation by doing uh, the fulfilling the mitzvah through chalitza, through the undoing of it, but cannot do yibum because maybe she's not obligated yibum. And then you're marrying your brother's brother, which are, your husband's brother, which you're not allowed to do unless there's an obligation of yibum. Safeki, that's totally relevant to our purposes, but Safeki Rushim, what would be a case of Safeki Rushim? Okay, Safeki Rushim, he throws her, let's say, the ring, and we're not sure if it landed closer to him, closer to her. Okay, we saw cases of Get like that. What's Safeki Rushim? Not the similar case by Get, but our case. Our three cases of the Gizgitim that are valid on a Torah level, invalid on a rabbinic level. So what do we say? Right? These cases, Hareza Safeke Roshin. Now, according to this, if she's potentially, the heir of a woman is potentially divorced, but by this kind of divorce, which is valid by Torah, invalid on a rabbinic level. Now, what should happen then? If you say it's enough of a get to say she doesn't have to get divorced from the second husband, then Sarata Atil Yibume. 
then you're basically saying the get is valid because she doesn't have to get divorced from the second guy. So that means that she's really divorced from the first guy, which means that the second wife of the first husband should actually have to do Yibam. So the Gemara says, actually, really, she should. But the rabbis were strict on her and said, don't do Yibam, just do Chalit. So it's not really a question on Rav. Now, so Rav had said, sometimes we're going to say she has to get divorced, sometimes we, we, we don't make her. Levi says you really never have to get divorced. These disqualifications of the Gitin in our mission don't make you get divorced. They said to the sons, Rabbi Yochanan said to the sons of Rabbi Chalafta, this is what your father said, meaning Rabbi Chalafta, number one, and he taught this other halacha, what is this, my kartzit? It's a, a bee that you find in between the, or um, or a fly, some sort of insect that you find in between the bundles of, of the grains. And what does it have to do with mechatat? Okay, this is an interesting halacha, totally disconnected. It says that the mechatat, that's the paradigm of water, just supposed to be mayim chayim el keli. They're supposed to go straight from the stream into the vessel. If they were put in anything else in the interim, it's a problem. Disqualifies them. So what if an insect, okay, anyone, drank from the water? What happens when you drink? You spit out a little bit. So as you drink, you always spit out a little. So therefore, if they drink and they spit out a little, some of the water is going to have been in some other receptacle in the mouth of this insect before it got spit out. But a kartzit, Shabbat meal, ain't a posel the assumption is the kartzit swallows it entirely, doesn't spit any out. And because of that, if, if they drank from that water, it wouldn't disqualify it because what they drank, they drank, and what's left wasn't in their mouth. So he says, wait a minute. This halach is a problem because it says somewhere else that all birds disqualify mechatat other than the yona, because the yona is motzet, to which they say, the kartzit should have been in this list as well. Uh, the answer is, first of all, you could say maybe it's not an oaf, it's not really a bird. But the answer they answer is, it's not a, a, a clear-cut thing about the kartzit. It depends on its size. If it's large, then it doesn't disqualify because the large ones swallow everything. If it's small, it disqualifies it because it does spit out. And therefore, they just didn't mention in the exception to the rule, they didn't mention this because it's sometimes an exception to the rule, sometimes not. Depends if it's big or small. God, comma, what's the size that we're talking about here, big and small? I'm a Rabbi Yirmiya, Rabbi Itam, Rabbi Ami, Ad Kazayit. Okay, until a Kazayit. Ad Kazayit already, it's. Okay. Now we're going to have a whole long section about how we pass in on this big, famous machloka we've seen. Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Meir, Edi Masir, Edi Khatima. We're going to have a whole long section just about who held what, blah, blah, blah. And almost all of them are really Rabbi Elazar, you're going to see. We hold like Rabbi Elazar when it comes to get. So Rabbi Yehuda says, when I said this in front of Shmuel, Amar Notice Rav said only by get. Shmuel says even in regular documents, Eidi Masira is what's important, not the Eidi Chatim. Rav says not Bishtaro, but look at our Mishnah. Because you can ex- collect from lien property, which seems to indicate specific, even other documents as well, according to Rabbi Lazar. To which they answer, Rabbi Lazar Very simple. Rabbi Lazar said, by get, and by other documents. And Rab held like him by get, didn't hold like him by other documents. So while it's true that Rabbi Lazar in our mission clearly says this applies to other documents as well, well, Rab didn't hold that way. Rab held only like Rabbi Elazar when it comes to get and not by other documents. Okay, he also, they said the name Rabbi Yishob and Levi, we pass on like Rabbi Elazar when it comes to get. Rabbi Yana says it doesn't even have Rech get if there are no signatures. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that, okay, we learned about Rech get. it means you're, she's not even a divorcee for the sake that she can't, she can't marry a Kohen. Now, if it doesn't have signatures, well, that is, right, that it seems to go against Rabbi Elazar, which is what the Gemara is going to say. It doesn't make any sense. Rabbi Yana, late, late to Rabbi Elazar, he says, what, if there's no signatures, it doesn't, it's not considered to get at all. That sounds like Rabbi Meir, not Rabbi Elazar. It sounds like the opposite. 
Hachikara. This is what he really meant to say. He wasn't paskening against Rabbi Elazar, God forbid, because everyone seems to think we paskin like Rabbi Elazar. But what he was saying is, according to the rabbis, which is really Rabbi Meir here, according to Rabbi Meir, it wouldn't even be a recha get. What Rabbi Elazar thinks is a perfectly good get, according to Rabbi Meir, isn't even considered to get at all. There's no signatures. It's not a get. But that's only Rabbi Meir. It's not like he holds it. And we're going to see the same thing again. Here, Vachinim Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chanina, with different names. Amar Rish Lakish said in the name of Rish Lakish, Halacha ki Rabbi Elazar begitim, we paskan like him beget. For Rabbi Yochanan Amar, afilu reach aget enbo. Rabbi Yochanan said, there's not even a reach aget if there's no signatures. To which again, Lema Rabbi Yochanan lately to Rabbi Elazar, does Rabbi Yochanan not hold it to Rabbi Elazar? No. Hachi Kamar, the Rabbanan, afilu reach aget enbo. Exactly as we answered a minute ago. Shalach le Rabbi Abba Barzab del Mari Barat. So now Rabbi Abba Barzab descends to Mari Barav, by me name of Rafuna, Alchak, Rabbi Lazar, Bikiti, O and Alchak, do we pass on the camera? Adahaki not enough shade to Rafuna. So he said to go send the question to Rafuna. In the meantime, Rafuna dies. Amale, so they don't get to find out what he thought. But Rabbi, his son tells them, Amale, Rabbi Bure, Haki Amar Abba Mishmei de Rava. He passed, he said in the name of Rava, Alchak, Rabbi Lazar, Bikiti. We pass on like Rabbi Lazar. Again, we're getting a very long thing here. Also, the rabbis who knew Dvar Alacha and passed it on the name of Rav also said, Who is this? To Amar of Chamer Berguria. Chamer Berguria must be the rabbis who knew Halacha, said in Amar Rav, said in the name of Rav, Halacha Rabbi Lazar Begiti. Ike de Amr, some people have a different version of that last statement. Okay, the Chavirim who know Alacha and the students of Rav said in the name of Rav. Who's this? The Amar of Chista, Amar of Chamer Berguria, Amar Rav Halacha Rabbi Lazar Begitim. So the Chaverim who became the Dvar Halacha is Rav Chista and not Rav Chamer Berguria. But anyway, pass the name of Chamer Berguria in the name of Rav Halacha Rabbi Lazar Begitim. The Chen Ki Atar Rav in Amar Rabbi Lazar Amar Rav. Also, Ravin brought the Torah of Eretz Israel in the name of Rabbi Lazar. That's Rabbi Lazar the Amora in the name of Rav who passed down the Halacha of Rav. That Halacha to Rabbi Lazar Begitim. Okay, if you weren't convinced enough. It seems clear we pass on Kim beget. Seems like most people don't think we pass on Kim in other matters, though. Okay, moving on because it's very late now. Shnu Mishnah. Shnayim Shashachu Shnei Gitim Shavim Vinik Arvu. Okay, we'll start this topic today. Two people sent two Gitim with the exact same name. Two husbands, two wives, same name, sent with the same Shaliach. And he got mixed up. Which one was which? So what does he do? It has to be Lishma. So, Noten Lishnehem Lishnehem Lizo Vishnehem Lizo. He takes the get, gives it to this one, then gets it back from her, I guess, as a gift, because remember, it has to be owned by the husband, then gives it back to the second one and gives it to her. So each one got, in other words, he gives does that with both gets. So each one received two gets. One of them was the right get, one of them was not. But if he loses one on the way, none of them is good because we don't know which was which. Case number two, five people wrote a general language. We divorce. And then there's this one, this one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and then they write the rest of the version of the get. Ish mekaresh plonit, uploni plonit, right? This one is divorcing this one, this one's divorcing this one. Haidim and lamata, the gets signed by witnesses at the bottom. Kulam shalim, totally valid get. You know, tell the chalachat again, you give the get, get it back, give the get, give it back, give the get, give it back, okay? And you go like this. It's totally fine. However, case number three, hayakatuf tofes, the chalachat echad, if it's Got, and then we're going to see later what's klal, what's tofes. That's going to be starting tomorrow. If it says, you know, this get for this person, and then underneath it says this get that person, and then this one, that one. Ha'idim in lamata, and the edim are signed at the very bottom of the document. Etchai edim nikrimi mo kashel. Only the one right above the signatures is good. The rest are no good. Because it could be the edim just signed on the bottom one and didn't sign on all the others. So first the Gemara says, Mantana Amar Rabbi Yirmiyah de Loke Rabbi Elazar. This can't be Rabbi Elazar because it's all about the importance of the signatures, right? And what do we say here? De'i Rabbi Elazar. Kevant Amar Edim is Sirakarte. Oh, no, this is the reason why it's going to be not like Rabbi Elazar. We're actually talking about the first case, the two people who sent the gets. What's the problem? E Rabbi Elazar. Kevant Amar Edim is Sirakarte. Halo Yade Behemi Nayo Kamagarsha. When they give the two gets to the two women and we don't know which is which, you're having a, an aided, the witnesses who see the passing over the get don't know which one's right or not. To which Abai says, what are you talking about? What do you say? The Edim Sira have to see in the Tina Lishma, they have to know which one was the right one. Who said? He said, you need Ketiba Lishma. He didn't say you needed to be given Lishma. So you can even explain our Mishnah according to Rabbi Lazar. You don't necessarily have to say it wasn't. Okay, interesting. After we just said, 
everyone holds Rabbi Elazar, it's better if you could kind of say the Mishnah, the simple Mishnah, reading of the Mishnah follows Rabbi Elazar, but could actually be Rabbi Meir, even though we don't pass in it. Okay, we're going to stop here and get to the question about the Klal and the Tophes in tomorrow's daf. Um, that's it for today. Again, just to review the last section. So we had this machloka, but Rav sometimes said she has to get divorced and that get, and sometimes not. Then we brought some questions on him. And then we saw that many other people said, actually, all these Gitim that are psulim in our Mishnah, you actually don't have to get divorced if you got married based on that. And then we got to all the psikot, like Rabbi Lazar. And then we ended with this last Mishnah of gets where we're not sure exactly whose get it is, or gets that are given to a number of different women. Which times does it work? Which times doesn't it? We'll get more into that tomorrow. Wishing everybody a great day.